Ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to this uh, very special session on transforming nations, uh, especially with knowledge and uh, technology. Uh, the, trans the technology piece and the acquisition of knowledge, I think, is key to every growing nation and to every established nation. Uh, we have two wonderful speakers of stature who've uh, you know, built phenomenal companies who are really managing challenges and change in their own companies. And uh, I promise that this will be a very exciting session. It will be a session which is thought-provoking, which uh, may be freewheeling with some of the questions you'd like to ask, and I hope it's a useful discussion. I'd like to introduce uh, both of them. Uh, Paul Jacobs is uh, the chairman and the CEO who started this company called Qualcomm. Uh, Qualcomm did a lot of innovative things at the, at the time when they started, but uh, more than anything else, I think they caused a revolution in the way uh, technology and digitization was uh, being used. Uh, they continue to grow, and uh, I think Paul continues to give it some phenomenal direction, and they're in every sphere of activity. Uh, they're a very key member of uh, the Indian subcontinent, a very welcome member of and a friend of India, so um, thank you, Paul, for being here. Uh, Vishal, of course, everybody knows, is spearheading one of India's uh, largest IT companies, uh, taking it, I think, into version three now. And, um, you know, th uh, with the challenges which all companies face, I think he's taken it in the process of taking it to a new stratosphere, uh, changing the way people think, revolutionizing the way we manage companies. And uh, I think India is very proud of uh, Infosys, will continue to be there, and they have a great leader with them. So welcome, both of you, and thank you so much for being part of this. I will uh, now invite Paul to present, and maybe we should just go there, we shall. Both of these? Choose whatever one I want. All right. Is that good? Then, now, now it's really out there. All right, good. Well, thanks, everybody. And uh, Preetha, thanks very much for inviting me. When I got the email and it was you at Berkeley, I figured that's, you know, that's just fate. I got to be here. So uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here. Preetha and I know each other for oh, quite some time, actually, due to the US-India CEO Forum. Uh, we've had lots of good discussions about how to use mobile for healthcare, and uh, we're going to find some really good projects to do together. So, um, so we've been working at it. But uh, Qualcomm's been in, in India for quite some time, and, uh, and it really is very, very important for us. And I thought, uh, you know, in the context of this conference and in the context of this session, just talking about how mobile technology really has been this catalyst for change, this opportunity for partnership. Um, and it's not a theoretical thing. Uh, it's something that we have long history doing. And I'm going to show you some historical information about what's happened in India that made, I think, fundamental changes in the way that people were able to interact with each other and interact with the world around them for, for all sorts of you know, positive reasons. So um, really, just to start off with, you've heard some statistics already in terms of the reach of wireless technology. I mean, I, I am sure that everybody in this room has a smartphone. If you don't have a smartphone, can you raise your hand? <laughs> okay, and then probably most of those smartphones have a Qualcomm chip in them. And Probably that chip, in fact, almost certainly that chip has content that was designed in India. So almost certainly all of you are carrying around some technology that was designed in India, and you use it every single day, and your life pretty much depends on it. And I would say that wireless technology really has become, I would, I would argue, I think correctly, not with hype, that it's the, the biggest technology platform humankind has ever created. Uh, there's 7.4 billion connections right now. That's not 7.4 billion individuals, obviously, for obvious reasons, but uh, probably about half that are, are unique 
individuals, and it, and it continues to grow as time goes on. And it's so pervasive that it's said that more people have access to cellular technology than have access to electricity or running water. And we all hear stories about people in rural areas who have to hike somewhere to go get their phone charged and then go back to their place where they live or, or where, where they're, um, you know, where they're habiting, inhabiting and, uh, and then use their phone. And, and we want to change that. We want to, we want to fix that. We want to make sure that it is pervasive everywhere, that people have the ability to not just communicate, but charge their phone, get education, get all the benefits from, from, uh, from, from this. And so this platform, it, it's amazing, and, it, and it's created tons of opportunities in all sorts of areas, healthcare, education, entrepreneurship, public safety, e-governance. Uh, we heard about smart cities. I'm going to talk a little bit about smart cities as well. So all of these kinds of areas are, are enabled by this tremendous platform. So let me, let me just, before I continue on the future, let's talk about the past a little bit. And I actually went to India. I was running a program called Wireless Local Loop, which was taking a thing that was a cellular telephone, but packaged up into a, a box that looked like a landline phone. And I actually went on the first engineering uh, trip to go map out the spectrum and figure out where we were going to install the equipment and so forth. And then we went back and we went to install the first telephone at the head of MTNL's uh, office. And so we walked in, plugged it in, and went to walk away. And he said, oh, what, you're going to, I thought you were going to install some equipment here. So we did. That's it. And uh, so he picked up the phone and he called his wife. And his wife said it was the best uh, phone call she had heard on the system. So I thought we were in. Took a little bit longer for things to move, move along. I think I was there in the middle of, uh, of the 90s. And uh, by the end of the 90s, though, the wireless local loop systems had come out. And MTNL, uh, you can see on this chart, the red line shows the price uh, of access. And the other line, uh, bluish gray line, shows the number of people that were getting on the system, number of connections that there were. And you can see there's this great expected correlation there that when the price comes down, more people get on the system. And what really happened there was MTNL started by lowering the rates. The government then allowed the wireless local loop, so these were fixed operators, to have uh, limited mobility rights. That also put pressures on the rates of the GSM, because the mobile operators were running GSM systems at the time. So that put pressure on the rates, and the rates kept coming down, down, down. And now you know that they're quite, quite inexpensive at this point. Uh, worked with you know, a number of companies. Reliance was a, a key early partner of ours, uh, driving, the, driving the systems out, driving the prices down. But that, I would say, is a thing that we are, as a company, are incredibly proud of being part of that. And we talk about partnerships here. That was absolutely a partnership with the local Indian operators, with the Indian government. Uh, it took a lot of, it, more than a village, I guess, to, to create this kind of a dynamic. But it was a really an amazing dynamic that that occurred. And now what's going on is that we're going to mobile broadband. So that was a lot about voice connectivity and very slight data connectivity. But now we're talking about mobile broadband. And you can see the kinds of, of growth. And you heard over a billion connections in, in India today. Um, and you know this is we're talking about today. There's probably 180 million uh, connections on the mobile broadband systems, 3G, 4G systems. But that's, that's changed. They're, they're projected to be over 540 million connections. And these are state-of-the-art 3G, 4G connectivity. And there's a lot of effort going around building that out. And we also had, a, I think, a, a pretty key role in causing the change for 4G to go to the global standard. We actually went and spent a billion dollars on Spectrum in in India, which is a long story, but that spectrum now is being used by Bharti uh, to, to provide uh, 4G services. Uh, an interesting statistic that, that I have is that uh, mobile data traffic, so there's strong demand for the mobile data traffic and, uh, and video content consumption and so forth. So uh, mobile data traffic grew by 74% in 2014 year over year, and in 2015, 89%. So you are seeing huge growth in demand for, for mobile data. And this was done by a broad, broad ecosystem of partners. So this was not 
Qualcomm by ourselves by no means. This was a, a, lot of, a lot of partnerships and building that ecosystem and having our heritage as a company really being about building an ecosystem is part of what the opportunity for the future is right now because what we were able to do working with partners, for example, in South Korea and in China brought companies like LG and Samsung from being manufacturers of, you know, uh, consumer electronics to being, you know, world telecom players. Similarly, in China, you see Huawei and ZTE and Xiaomi and all the, you know, the names that we now know. Those companies started as very small players in the telecom industry. We worked with them uh, and helped them build up their manufacturing design capabilities. And I believe now is the time that that, we're right at that time in India right now. So we are really focusing a lot of effort on, on trying to make that, that happen. And, and we've been in India, as I said, for, for quite some time. So it's not like this is some new effort for us. And we're not, we're not just coming because now is the time. We've been there a long time. We have a lot of people in India already. Um, you know, as part of this revolution, obviously, it's, you know, we're, we talked earlier, everybody's got a smartphone and it and really is the, the, the main way that people in many markets get their access to the internet. They, there's not as widespread a penetration of PCs. So the smartphone, that is the connectivity methodology. And now the question is, how do we get more of them? And how do we make them less and less and less expensive? And that was another area, I think, of a lot of pride for us, because uh, over the history of the company, we've been trying to drive the cost down. And when it was just feature phones, and we were in India, and the CDMA phone cost, uh, I guess, it was $40 at the time, and we were charging a 5% royalty on it, and people said, well, why don't you make that royalty zero? You'll make the phone $38, and how can you charge people in India a royalty? And we said, look, we're going to take that money. We're going to invest in research and development. We're going to build an ecosystem. We're going to drive the prices down, and I'll come back, and it'll be half that price. So instead of being a $38 phone, it's going to be a $20 phone or a $16 phone. And lo and behold, that worked. That, that business model was the right business model, and that's what drove the cost down. And it's doing the same thing now on the smartphone side. So you see very high-featured smartphones, very capable smartphones, kind of in the 5,000 rupee level, $75 kind of level. There are some below $50 US. There's continuing driving the, the price down. And that will go even faster, I think, to the extent that we get more and more Indian-based manufacturers in, and designers into, into this ecosystem worldwide. And, and it's a great, great opportunity because the projections are for uh, next five years, nine billion smartphones to ship. So there's, there's real, real opportunity. Um, we're expecting that in emerging regions, the smartphone installed base will go from 2.4 billion in 2016 to 3.6 billion in 2020. So, so a tr tremendous opportunity. But even beyond that, there's this whole new opportunity, which I think is another opportunity for India to leapfrog and go into the, the Internet of Things. And we've heard various pieces of these talked about healthcare and smart cities, obviously big automotive transportation uh, opportunity there, com compute, I mean, all these different areas, tremendous, tremendous opportunity because there's going to be more of these things, of Internet of Things things, of stuff connecting to other stuff and to the cloud and private clouds, all these. So people are talking, you know, instead of 9 billion smartphones, there's 20 billion Internet of Things things or 50 billion Internet of Things things. So the numbers are staggering. The opportunities are tremendous. Um, and we're doing some work also on smart cities. So you heard about smart cities. We have a, a project in uh, Jaipur with the Jaipur Development Authority to create an innovation hub there uh, focused on smart cities and on smart city technology. You know, it's a lot about energy management and uh, transportation management, all these, uh, these kinds of opportunities. But um, what I think that India is a, a wonderful place to showcase the, the real benefits, um, as Solomon was already, already talking about so aptly. So a really huge opportunity there. A, a smartphone by itself is great. This is an even more exciting one. And then we're also looking at, you know, I talked about 3G and 4G for mobile broadband. Now it's 
not just mobile broadband as we look to the next generation of technology. So mobile broadband's great, and we're gonna go to the next generation and make things faster and lower latency. You'll click and you'll get things, you know, more video, more virtual reality, all kinds of the, all these wild applications people are talking about. But, you know, when we talk about healthcare, these are mission critical services. You don't want the call to drop when your life depends on it. So 5G is gonna be about that as well. It's a suite of different technologies able to adapt to different applications. And I would say this is the first time where the technologies are application driven even to a greater extent. For sure, 4G, 3G, we thought a lot about the internet and video and those things. But this is really about spreading mobile technology into many, many other industries. Uh, so giving very secure, very reliable connectivity uh, you know, very interesting. And then I talked about Internet of Things, and, and with the Internet of Things, part of the issue is that you're gonna have a lot of them, they're gonna be very cheap, they're gonna be spread all through out the world, they gotta be very power efficient, they have to be very secure. You know, huge, huge opportunities there, as I said, but, but also very specific kinds of demands on the system that's going to connect all those things to the rest of the cloud. And, and I think India is in a wonderful position to benefit and also to be in the place to help design that as well. And so, so that, that notion that we have these applications, what's, what's it really about fundamentally? I mean, fundamentally, it's about the people that use it and what, what can we do. Um, and you know, if you look at some of the numbers in terms of access to the internet, you know, I talked a little bit about that earlier, but there's uh, internet uh, access in emerging regions by mobile technology in, uh, in 2010 was about 870 million people, 2015, 2.5 billion people. That's how they were getting on the internet, which basically is kind of the number of people that get on the internet. You know, if you, if you hear people quote the internet reach, um, 3.8 billion people by 2020. So the numbers continue to grow very dramatically. 76% uh, of the total user, internet user base in India comes over, uh, over mobile devices. And so, um, so that's a, a queer impact. But there's some other things that we've been doing with the, the mobile technology. So we have a program called Wireless Reach, where what we do is use the connectivity, work with NGOs, work with local device manufacturers or wireless operators, and we do programs for social benefits. And some of these are, are well known, so I, this is a little bit of, of history, but Maybe you've heard of Fisher Friend. Fisher Friend was an application that we started in, in the aftermath of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami where the fishermen were scared to go back out on the, on the water. They didn't know what the weather conditions were going to be like. This program started on feature phones with very low data rates. Now, of course, it's, it's moved along to better and better capabilities, but, but still, that, that fundamental inexpensive connectivity gave the ability for the fishermen to know not just about the weather conditions, but which port to go bring their fish to. And if there have been economic studies done showing the improvement in their economic conditions based on having access to this technology. So I would say this, you know, the Fisher Friend was, was a huge success, started in India. We've actually brought it to, to other countries around the world. So that was one exciting one. Another one is in education. We uh, partnered with Sesame Street, uh, Golly Golly Sim Sim, and uh, did some applications that were downloaded, taught math and literacy and so forth. And uh, these things have been uh, you know, used very broadly uh, by, by children in India, also on relatively inexpensive devices. Obviously, as we're able to drive the cost of the devices and the cost of the service down, we get much, much broader usage. So. Um, we're actually quite focused on this notion of how do you get mobile broadband to more schools. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that we've come up with, pretty high tech. Uh, so this is a picture of a satellite system that we're building. Uh, Sunil Middle from Bardi is one of the founding investors with us, Airbus and uh, Virgin. So maybe you've heard Richard Branson talking about this thing. That's this system that we're, we're building over 700 satellites, and it will provide mobile broadband everywhere, and the idea is that schools are one of the key places that we want to have connectivity, and what it will do is it actually will provide the connectivity from the satellite to a very inexpensive base station that will have both solar power 
and the antenna to go up to the satellite. So essentially you take this box, you put it in place, allow it to see the sky, it gets its power from the sky, it gets its connectivity from the sky, and then it radiates 3G, 4G, uh, Wi-Fi, all sorts of connectivity, it can have content caches inside it so that the curriculum can be downloaded to the devices. So really an interesting opportunity. And what this will do is provide connectivity, as you said, for Loon, similar concept. I think there's a little bit more proven kind of technology to, to do this. We'll, we'll see how that all plays out. But this is going to, this will launch. I mean, this system, uh, we're going to put the test satellites up in 2017. The constellation will go up in 2019. Uh, we're building the stuff right right as we speak. There's a factory that just got set up in, uh, in Florida to churn out these 700 plus satellites. We're already designing the second generation to get even more mobile broadband out there. So um, this, I think, is going to be quite exciting because now we won't talk about cellular coverage in terms of the coverage of population, which is how people talk about it today. We'll talk about it in terms of coverage of geography, meaning that there are places that are lightly populated or that people just pass through, which have no connectivity now. With a box deployed, they will have that in the future. So it's a very, very exciting vision we're, we're in the process of. And another vision that we are 100% in, in support of is, the, is this Make in India vision of, of Prime Minister Modi. And uh, I had this wonderful opportunity before uh, his speech in Silicon Valley, we got a chance to sit down and he was asking the, the CEOs in the audience, you know, or in the, in the room with him, you know, what suggestions do you have? And I said, well, it's not just about make in India because you have this huge competitive advantage of design in India as well. And he really picked up on that and it was quite exciting because during his speech he sort of talked about design in India, he nodded towards me, so I felt, uh, felt like my message had gotten through, which was, you never know. Um, but um, you know, it's it's really this opportunity now to create a lot of lot of job growth. Uh, I mean, there's all sorts of different quotes, and we've done studies. Maybe 2.4% uh, of India GDP in 2014 was from mobile. Uh, expect over 2 million jobs in India to be created over the next few years. Um, so uh, about uh, half a million. Of, uh, sorry, five. Yeah, 500,000. Half a million of those be in small, medium enterprises. So anyway, so the quotes are, are interesting. I, you know, we'll see how it plays out, but, but that opportunity is there. And we're actually in India doing a number of things to try and accelerate innovation there. So we have a Design in India challenge that's going on. We had 10 finalists in April. We're going to have the, the winners at the end of uh, 2016. And we have an in, uh, innovation lab that we launched in Bangalore. So uh, we incubate startups there, and we're kind of combining these challenges along with the infrastructure to help, uh, help the companies actually take their devices to commercial readiness with engineering support and other kinds of uh, uh, resources that, that we can provide to them. Uh, we have this uh, woman in, women in tech, uh, obviously a critical issue globally, getting, uh, getting more women involved in technology, but this is... Uh, thing where we're uh, engaged in STEM with high school girls in uh, Bangalore, uh, building mobile applications. And then we have an Indian investment fund where we have a $150 million fund. Uh, we've actually been investing in India since uh, 2007. We have over 20 companies. Uh, Map My India, if you've heard of, of that, a mapping company. Apps Daily, you know, it's a mobile app delivery, reveries, translation, there's a housing, there's a uh, home medical services, actually, pro Portia. Uh, anyway, so we have a number of areas where we're trying to be more engaged in, in India than we have in the past. Uh, and I have to say we've been very engaged in India in the past. So we really have very high, high hopes there. We continue to build out our workforce there, uh, more and more locations, more and more employees. So more and more of the stuff that's in your pocket will be designed in India in the future. I look forward to working with all of you to make that happen. Thank you. Paul, thank you so much. That was an outstanding presentation. Um, all of us knew 
about the work which is happening uh, in India with Qualcomm, but I think seeing it like this just reinforced the belief that you're probably Indian or you were in your last Janma. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you so much. What I did not tell the audience that uh, Paul is also a member of the India-US CEOs forum and um, of, of the World Economic Forum on the International Business Council. He is an alumnus of uh, UC Berkeley and chairs the advisory board of the College of Engineering at UC Berkeley. So I think there's a dual purpose that we had him here this evening. Thank you so much again for being here. Uh, our next speaker is um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Vishal Sikha. Congratulations on the award and thank you for accepting it on behalf of AIMA. He's a, an outstanding innovation leader and is driving Infosys transformation into an innovative and future-ready IT services company. He's turning Infosys into a leader in application of the new technologies such as artificial intelligence and big data. A technology trailblazer before joining Infosys, he spent 12 years with SAP where he led product development and innovation and became a member of the executive board. A PhD in computer science from Stanford, he had founded two technology startups, which he sold, and he also had a stint at the famous Xerox Research Labs. But I think uh, we, as Indians, are lucky that he heads Infosys now, and thank you for joining us. We'd like you to address the group. Thanks so much, Prita, and thanks, Rekha, thanks, everyone. I hope you don't hold my having a Stanford degree against me <laughs> on a day in, uh, in Berkeley. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues from Stanford, um, uh, who is an academic brother of mine, uh, shared the same PhD advisor, is Professor Stuart Russell, who teaches here in computer science um, and is a famous professor of artificial intelligence. Um, I'll just share with you this, my obligatory Stanford Berkeley story. The, uh, uh, when Stuart was uh, receiving the uh, Young Investigator Award many years ago, uh, his PhD advisor, Mike Janesareth, who was also my PhD advisor, was asked to do the speech. And uh, Mike gave a wonderful speech about Stuart and all his accomplishments. And then at the end of the speech, Mike said something shocking. He said, uh, so the moral of the story is, if you want to be with the best, you have to go to Berkeley. And this was uh, very surprising coming from a Stanford professor that he said something like that. And then after a dramatic pause, he said, of course, if you want to become the best, you have to come to Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> it is a real pleasure for me to be here with all of you. And especially thanks for the award. Uh, um, given my, my crazy life, uh, I... Uh, uh, we actually had to get the award done here in the Bay Area, which is also my home. I uh, was thinking about the agenda, uh, the topic of transforming nations and empowering people through knowledge and, and technology, and uh, thinking about my own uh, journey. Uh, of course, I'm Indian, uh, but I've been here in the U.S. for the last 28 years or so, uh, and I'm a U.S. citizen, but I travel to... Uh, to India every month. And um, as I think about um, this idea of transforming nations and especially and this idea of empowering people through, through knowledge and technology, sitting here in, in Silicon Valley, the, uh, uh, it, is, it is very interesting. Um, what comes to my mind is, uh, is basically three things. Um, the three enabling pieces of this mission of transforming nations and empowering people through knowledge and technology. The three things are democracy, technology, and education. Uh, last week, earlier this week actually, was the 4th of July, and uh, next month is the 15th of August, the two independence days of the two largest democracies in the world. Um, and a couple of days ago, Hillary Clinton was in North Carolina, and the president, President Obama, was campaigning with her. And uh, Secretary Clinton made a very interesting statement as she was introducing the president. She said, in 1776, when the US democracy was 
in the process of being founded, um, the founding fathers who were there in the room, nobody in the room looked like President Obama or like Secretary Clinton. And yet they created an institution by which both uh, have the opportunity to do what they did. And regardless of our political affiliation, um, I think that we can all agree that that's a very important point, that a institution that gets created where despite our differences, um, such an atmosphere can be created where um, a diversity of thought, a diversity of people, a diversity of opportunity can be created. And indeed an institution where the more that we differ, the more that differing points of view come together, the richer the institution becomes. Design of such a system, of such an institution that lives for 240 years and continues to thrive, it's extraordinary. And I have studied this a lot, uh, the setup of the US Constitution and, and so forth. And uh, Ben Franklin was perhaps the greatest of the founding fathers. Uh, he made a very interesting speech at the Constitutional Convention, where he said that the idea of this convention and the idea of the setup of the democracy is not that everybody agrees or that everybody is in alignment, but that nobody does, and yet the system continues to thrive and continues to become richer and, and stronger uh, as a result of the diversity of opinion and the diversity of the people. When we look around Silicon Valley, I think that this particular idea is exemplified, it is, it is lived more than anything else. So I think that my first point is that the key enabling factor in order to transform nations and in order to empower people with this idea of knowledge and technology is to enable this kind of a very deep-rooted sense of personal freedom where people and their ideas, and, in, and especially their diversity, can not only be tolerated, but can be celebrated. And with the more diverse opinions coming into the system, the system actually continues to become stronger. And I think, despite 240 years of the US democracy and close to 70 years of the Indian democracy, this idea, when we look around the times that we are living in, is still a not a very prevalent idea, and I think that that is a shame. That is, uh, uh, I wish there were more uh, of these kinds of institutions which thrive with diversity and which enable the empowerment of people. The second in key ingredient is technology. And uh, as Paul mentioned in his speech very eloquently, connectivity and digital technology, which of course his company is a, one of the pioneering drivers of, uh, is reshaping the world around us in a very, very profound way, in every industry and in every walk of life. The, um, when we look at the idea of a computer, um, Sam is here, Sam will talk later, and I grew up in India at a time when the uh, PCOs that he invented basically connected India in a way that was uh, uh, completely unprecedented and, and completely liberating and empowering. Um, and we are now living in times where basically every walk of life is being completely transformed in a very fundamental way. I was reading about Airbnb at the event that when the Prime Minister came here to the Silicon Valley and, and Paul was there. Um, I was sitting next to the founder of Airbnb on the table and he told me that Airbnb by March of this year became three times larger than the second largest hotel chain, which Marriott or Starwood, I don't know which one, but one of those, and uh, three times larger. And by December of this year, it will be five times larger. Uh, and this is a technology company that basically became the world's largest hotel company. Um, of course, Tesla has just down the street here on the East Bay, um, is one of the great car companies, a technology company. I mean, Elon Musk was the founder of PayPal. Uh, a, a, you know, a technology company that has become a car company. And you see Apple having recently shipped 25 millionth watch, uh, not to mention the phone. Uh, the smartphone is actually a computer in the shape of a phone. And more and more as we see the evolution of the digital world around us, we are beginning to realize that the computer is not just something with a keyboard and a screen and peripherals, but it is actually this ultimate kind of a machine that can be morphed into all these shapes like a car or a watch or a band. Um, and and this, this device, this idea, this ultimate machine is reshaping the world around us. So when we 
think about this notion of what the world of the future uh, is going to look like and how um, all the industries around us, every walk of life around us is going to be reshaped by, by this device, by, by this idea of computing and, and connectivity, uh, we realize that therein lies a tremendous disruption, but also a tremendous opportunity. And when I look at my own world of, of services that, that Infosys works in, the same threat and the same opportunity applies to, to my company as well. Um, the idea of, of uh, technology and uh, software eating the world that Mark Anderson talks about uh, applies as much to the services industry as to any other industry. So when I think about what the future um, uh, is like, and in, in my case, in the case of, of Infosys and in the, broadly in the case of India, uh, there is a deeper matter here of uh, what happens to the people. India is not so much a manufacturing company despite the Prime Minister's uh, passionate pursuit of Make in India, which is a relatively recent idea. Um, when I started at Infosys about two years ago, I, uh, I had a conversation uh, with, with Mukesh Bhai and Mukesh Ambani and he told me that we shall keep one thing in mind, more than the growth and the profits, the and the innovation and all of that, people raise their children in India dreaming that they will go to work at Infosys. Last year, uh, a million people applied for a job at Infosys. Uh, I was just reading this in the newspaper, it was in the newspaper a couple of days ago that that number of people applying to Infosys has crossed a million again and approximately 5% of them make it into our company. And I, I was shocked by that statistic. It is uh, uh, an astounding statistic that a million people um, apply for a, for a job. And when you think about the times that we are living in with computing transforming every industry, with, with AI te not technology having evolved to a point where <clears throat> it is becoming more and more exciting and more and more domains around us are becoming AI enabled, machine learning enabled, that this automation that is possible now for us is becoming a driver of a fundamentally new kind of opportunity, but also a very fundamental job change. What do we do from, um, from the point of view of people? How do we deal with this idea of empowering people with knowledge and technology? And my conclusion is very simple. It applies as much to Infosys as it does broadly to India and indeed to any industry that is being transformed by technology, which is that we have to embrace automation. We have to embrace artificial intelligence. At Infosys, our approach, our strategy is very straightforward. If we don't uh, embrace AI, if we don't embrace automation, then we will be victims of it. And even though we get particularly scared about artificial intelligence and I happen to have studied this in my graduate studies and, um, and so forth. So I tend to think of AI as yet another collection of technologies. But there is a sort of a myth associated with AI and we tend to think that, my goodness, this is something completely new and it is going to take over all the jobs and so on. But in reality, when we think about it, when we shed the fear of what is underneath this cover of AI, we realize that it is another technology. Uh, another collection of technologies similar to all the other technologies that we have seen going back to the Industrial Revolution or even earlier than that. And this is a technology that, yes, it disrupts jobs, it displaces jobs, but it actually creates even more opportunities. Uh, Deloitte recently did a study of um, the last 140 years of jobs, and it turns out that we are always scared of new technology displacing jobs, but what we don't realize is that it is a dynamic system that we live in, and the jobs that technology displaces are jobs of yesterday, and in doing so, the te new technology actually creates new kinds of jobs. So this, this treadmill, this revolution, this ongoing sets of revolutions, is where our future lies. And in the case of Infosys, it is very straightforward, and I think also more broadly, that AI technology and automation technology has to enable an improved productivity of people, an improved an amplification, if you will, of our abilities because of this technology. If we do that, 
we free up more bandwidth, we free up our productivity, we, we release uh, ourselves from the mundane things, the mechanizable things that AI can perform so that we can do other things. Professor Mashelkar in India has a wonderful way to say this. He says, being able to do more with less for more. It's the same idea. AI is a new collection of technologies in the same pantheon of technologies that enable us to do more with less for more. And the flip side of that, if we empower ourselves with technologies that enables us to do more with less for more, then we free up the bandwidth for us to become more innovative. So that is the second part of the equation, that automation that frees us up to, to do more enables us to unleash our creativity, our imagination, our ability to, to innovate. And then people ask me, do you seriously think that 200,000 employees can all be innovators? And the answer to that is, why not? Uh, yes, of course, every one of us can be an innovator. Uh, I believe that to a large degree, we can teach innovation. So I, two programs that I started uh, at Infosys, um, one is the zero distance, and Pita talked about this. It is this idea that in every project, we can do something innovative uh, by inspiring people to think about, you know. Steve Jobs used to say that the important thing in life is to realize that everything around us was built by people who are no superior to us. Therefore, we can do the same thing. And so why not? Think about the project that we are doing, and instead of just doing what you are told, why not think about what else can be done here, what could be done to improve what we are doing? It's a very basic idea. And then the second part of this is, is design thinking. Um, it was initiated at, at the D School, but, but here in Berkeley, there is some very interesting design programs as well. So various aspects, various kinds of design thinking are ways of teaching people to innovate in a systematic way. And today we still live in times where the act of innovation is, is something that we see as a mystical thing, that there are these innovators, there is the Zuckerberg, uh, there is the Steve Jobs, and they innovate. Um, and then we have conferences and workshops where we talk about innovation. But in reality, when we think about it, the act of innovation is no more than seeing something that is not there, uh, realizing that um, while we are all trained, our eyes, our brains are trained to see what is there, uh, some of us can see something that is not there and identify that if it was there, it would improve the world in, in some way or the other. So could we teach this idea of seeing some things that are not there, that if they were there, they would be desirable and, and feasible to do from an engineering point of view and viable economically? And I believe that this is something that can be taught in a very large scale way. Um, if there is, mathematically speaking, if there is an end to innovation, then we are all doomed, then AI will take over everything that we do and we'll all just sit around listening to music until we die or something. But, um, but I believe that there is no limit to human imagination, there is no limit to human creativity. As long as we have the ability to educate ourselves, as long as we have the ability to learn. So the third piece, of course, is of the democracy, technology, education triangle is education. Um, it is awesome that we are here in, in the Haas School a great institution of education. Uh, the ability to go to that unknown world of tomorrow and to be relevant in that unknown world of tomorrow is simply one ability that is education. Uh, our founder, Mr. Murthy, used to talk about learnability, the ability to learn. Uh, that is what, what it comes down to. So when I think about the world of tomorrow, um, whether it is the US or, or, or India, two great democracies, two great institutions to great countries which embrace this idea of, of individual empowerment, of, uh, of embracing technology and innovation um, to help us do more than we ever did before. Uh, you can only wish that uh, uh, more of us, there is more Silicon Valley's combinations of democracy, technology, and education. There are more institutions and organizations that support this. And I believe that uh, if we do that, then the best is still in front of us, and it's the future that is for ours to shape. Thank you very much.
Thank you, uh, Vishal, for that outstanding presentation. It's uh, that act of innovation, I think, is a wonderful keyword. Many of us need to see that, and then you'll have more innovators on this planet. Uh, we have both Paul and uh, Vishal who have played a tremendous role in, in the art of innovation, uh, internet of things, uh, connecting people through technology. I mean, there is so much happening out there, but I, had, I have two key questions, and you know, both of you can just uh, take it up and answer that before I throw it open. What is the one thing which you think uh, you know, the present government of India can do so that all your dreams, imagination will actually happen much quicker, faster, and, and better? And um, what do you see the world uh, you know, 10 years from now? Um, if you know, both of you can just take that up and talk about that. Paul, go for it. Oh, oh, uh, so two questions. What, what can the government of India... I mean, I, I, I think it's fundamental in any, any innovation economy that you create the opportunity for people to take risks, fail quickly, iterate, have the access to resources and capital, and you know, whether it's human capital, financial capital, the other resources. So just to the extent that we can um, see less friction, and I think that helps. Um, something very specific to India relative to the kind of things that we're trying to uh, create in terms of you know, more of the manufacturing ecosystem and more advanced manufacturing. Obviously, you know, investments in the fundamental underlying infrastructure are, are very critical to make sure that we have uh, the world-class infrastructure so that we can put more and more advanced uh, technologies and really build the complete supply chain for the kinds of innovations and, and devices and services around mobile. But, um, but I think if you step back, it's really, you know, what can a government do to reduce any, you know, wherever there's friction to taking risk and, and failing and getting back up and starting over again and creating critical mass. I think those are the things that are really, really important for innovation. Um, where are we going to be in 10 years? Like, in terms of technologies or healthcare, I mean, I think, you know, the sky is the limit, and I think that we don't really know fully yet sort of the implications of the, what they call exponential technology. So the fact that all of these things are happening faster and faster and faster, and, you know, Vishal talks about artificial intelligence, but I don't know whether you've noticed that in the last couple of years, your phone really understands what you say, and whereas it, it didn't happen before, and now people build upon that, so now they're building artificial uh, assistance for us. And people have been talking about that for a long time, but now it's finally capable. And you know, you see things like drones, and you know, that used to be a hard thing to do with a lot of capabilities. Now you take a chip that we put in a smartphone, stick it in a drone, and for very small amounts of money, lightweight, you know, that comes to be. So it's hard to extrapolate, extrapolate out uh, you know, I know the things that are going to happen inside your phone and with the devices that we carry around, the things that we're sort of working on for the future. I think there's some very exciting things around healthcare and um, using the phone not just as a communication device, but as a sensing device, whether it's sensing my health or whether it's sensing the environment around me. Uh, people have come up and talked to me about new technologies where when you touch the screen of your device, it's going to tell you all the different germs that, that are around you. So if you're worried about a new, some new health threat, well, we'll actually know it because all of these people phones in a certain area will tell us, hey, this is, there's something new over here. You, you need to watch out. And, or I can point my phone at, uh, at my food and see whether it's OK, see whether my coffee has caffeine in it, see whether my tuna fish has mercury in it, see whether you know, all these, you know, my, my drink at the bar, somebody alter, I mean, just all sorts of crazy things are, are going to happen around those, those areas. So maybe that, in that vein, I think we will have superpowers as people, our ability to see things that don't exist to our direct perception, whether right now we're working on making cyberspace and physical space more connected, but in the future, I think it's going to be increasingly about us knowing more about the physical space around us and what all the different things that are going on that we don't perceive as humans, but affect us as humans. 
And I think you know, the devices we carry with us are, are going to be a critical component of that. And then my question is whether my kids are actually going to live in this world or my grandchildren or whatever are going to live in this world or they're all just going to be sitting with the screen strapped to their faces and living in virtual reality. But that's a whole other story. I hope not. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, with regard to the government, totally agree with what Paul said. I think enabling innovation at uh, scale is something that if the government can, uh, can continue to do, I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, quite amazing that over the last two years, the government has done a lot in this area. But obviously, if even more is done to unleash the, uh, the innovative, innovative spirit in India, I think that would be, that would be awesome. I think uh, at a more tactical level, if they can have better roads in India, that would be that would be very welcome, uh, Sam. Maybe you can do something about it. The uh, the uh, every time I go to Bangalore, uh, every month I, it is probably the worst road infrastructure on the planet. The uh, and in terms of ten years from now, again, um, uh, Paul spoke extremely eloquently about this. I think uh, one area that I wish that we have a huge amount of progress in is in uh, computing literacy in teaching people, computer science and, and programming and, and so forth. I think for, uh, given that the world is becoming digital at such an exponential pace, I think that uh, the amount of literacy that we have in computing is still quite far behind. And um, uh, my wife runs our foundation, which is solely devoted to this idea of computer science education for everyone. I think that is an area that, uh, that um, needs a lot more attention, but you know, Hopefully, we will have lots and lots of computer literate kids, and uh, and then we'll all be flying in our drones to uh, with our virtual reality, self driving or self flying drones, I guess, uh, with our virtual reality glasses slapped on and watching movies or something. <laughs> Questions uh, from the audience? Yeah, can you just identify yourselves and keep it to a question and and not really too much of a comment, please? Sure, sure. Uh, superb, thank you. Uh, my name is Ken Silverman. I'm head of North America for Sonomous 4 Group. We are, in my words, the preeminent India market entry firm. Um, I have a question for Vishal. Uh, one of the things that you said that kind of slipped by that really stunned me to an extent is that you live in the U.S. Uh, Infosys is, and you do travel back and forth, Infosys is an iconic Indian company, and it seems to me that for a company like Infosys to reach into the U.S., clearly of Indian descent, but to reach into the U.S. for uh, a CEO is revolutionary. And so my question is, uh, I'm curious about the impact on emphasis, the culture, the people you work with, uh, by virtue of the fact that they have a CEO who primarily lives in India. And then to what degree do you see this as, I don't want to say a movement, but you might see it repeated in terms of other major Indian companies reaching to even Indians living in the US to become CEO? No, I think I think to a degree that is already happening. When I was at SAP, uh, Satya used to run the enterprise business at Microsoft, and uh, Sundar was running the mobile business at Google, um, and uh, Thomas Kurian was the head of products at Oracle, and Padma was the CTO of and head of engineering for Cisco. And the five of us used to get together every once in a while and and talk about this idea that you know the heads of products or key businesses in five of these big companies were all of Indian origin, and of course Ajay and Indra also run, uh, many others run global companies. So I think this is a combination of the, the US um, ideas, the American ideas around uh, empowerment and entrepreneurship uh, and innovation, uh, and the freedom to pursue your own uh, ideas, like, like Paul said, experiment, fail, repeat, uh, combined with the great Indian tradition of education. Um, and so I, I would certainly expect to see much more of this as more and more of the of us who have been educated in India or grew up in India and then come here, um, go through the experiences of both these amazing countries, um, go through this experience. As to my own situation, I think the travel is, is really bad. Um, I wish there was somehow a way to, to, to not have to travel so much, but uh, 
but, but you know, the headquarters is in Bangalore. I have 11 uh, major DCs in different parts of India. And uh, so there is no alternative to, to traveling a lot and, and being there. Uh, hopefully, in our lifetimes, we'll see communication, collaboration technology developed enough that it becomes a good substitute to being there. But for now, there, isn't, there is none. Uh, about 63% of our revenue comes from the U.S., so our customers are here. So it is good to be close to the customers and in the market. Of course, being in the valley uh, opens you up to ideas and, uh, and inventions. There is something going on in the valley all the time. I mean, whether you showed up in the valley 15 years ago or, or five years ago or now, or five years from now, there will always be something going on. And that is the amazing thing about the valley, is that there is always something going on. And uh, there is only one way to, uh, to be involved in that, which is to be there. So I think that being in Silicon Valley um, and being close to customers has multiple benefits for Infosys. Um, and the, the only way to bridge this divide is to travel a lot, which is the price that you pay. Then the lady at the back, next. My name is Ravi Mistri. Vishal, you are not the only one from the other school here. Uh, the question is, you mentioned about every project being innovative, uh, all of your 200,000 employees being innovative, and innovation can be taught. The question is, how can you teach that on a mass scale to the Indian people? Because an uneducated person also has the ability to improvise a process or a product that I have seen. So how do you structure it so that everybody can be innovative? Thank you. I think Paul mentioned the basic formula, which is to come up with an idea, experiment. Usually it, it fails and then repeat. Um, there is, the more rapidly you do that, the better, the more grounded contact you have with the outside world, uh, with the real world, the better. Uh, it is interesting, anybody can come up with innovative ideas on paper, but to go out there and try and do and then see what happens and then alter, uh, the, better you, uh, the better off you are. Uh, if you look at design thinking as a, as a methodology for innovation, it basically emphasizes problem finding. So when I talked about the act of seeing something that is not there, um, design thinking, the, the idea of need finding, of understanding the needs of an end user and what they are trying to get done. Not getting them to fill out surveys and questionnaires, but observing them and seeing what is missing, seeing what could be done that improves things. Uh, and then iterating that very rapidly in outside contact. So that empathy, that need finding, and being able to rapidly prototype and experiment, that is basically the mechanism to teach innovation. Um, the Stanford D School, um, three of the faculty went to Mysore uh, in Mysore, um, uh, Infosys has the, our university is there, and it is the largest corporate university in the world. And um, in October of 2014, about three months after I joined, I felt that we needed to teach people design thinking. And um, so the Stanford, with the help of the Stanford D School, we established a design thinking training there. And it was very, it was very interesting. When we crossed 25,000 people who had gone through this design program, um, I did a survey of them to see what impact it had had on their work. And um, about half of them were the newcomers into the campuses, we were 23, 24 year old kids who had just gone to college. And about the, the other half were the, the older employees who had been at Infosys for a while. And it was very interesting to see their responses to the questions. The, the younger employees had very terse, Twitter-like responses, and the older ones had more paragraph-long responses and so forth. And I was going through those, and I saw one of the employees had, had written, the, what was the impact that design thinking had on your, on your work or on your thinking? And, and he said that, uh, uh, I don't know if it was a um, he or a she, but uh, the answer was that my mom's sofa was broken and because of design thinking, I had the creative confidence that I could try and fix it. So in a one day long design thinking class, you don't turn into an innovator or a designer, but you can open up a switch in your head that it is okay to ask a question about why isn't that there? Why isn't the world like this? What if I did that? So I think that if you can teach that kind of a spirit at a massive scale, together with an atmosphere which encourages failure, 
uh, and rapid embrace of failure and rapid iteration, I think it could be done. And I believe that the more that the well-defined problems can be solved with AI, uh, the more the human frontier is going to be about identifying the next innovations. And so therefore, I believe that this is something that is essential for our future. We have, to, yes. I, I'll be quick, I just, because you talked about Stanford so much, I just wanted to say, we started a, we have a, we have a design uh, institute here in Berkeley. We just opened up a building. It's focused on undergraduates. Just anyways, go Bears. Thank you, Paul. We have time for exactly two questions. I'll take that gentleman in the corner. Could you just go ahead? This is, uh, and then Bob, the lady. This is uh, Bobby Gupta. Just a question to you, Paul. Uh, can you throw some more light on your Qualcomm ventures in India? Uh, what sort of investment you've done in the past? And what do you look at while putting money? Is, do you go at do, do your seed capital or you go at Series A? Uh, we actually will go up to B. So we'll go from seed to, to B. And uh, as, as I said, I mean, with a number of different companies, we have uh, $150 million earmarked for investment in, in India right now. Uh, and it's around a broad range of, of things, uh, but you know, mobile compute, internet of things. We, I mentioned some of the companies, so various services that are built on top of mobile broadband. Um, there's some healthcare is also a, a key area. So there are a set of things. Um, we, you know, we can, you can come to the website, they talk about various areas, we can, uh, people are interested in getting involved, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty easy, I mean, you can contact us and we will uh, make sure that the company gets talked to and we, we, have, we have people in country that are running the fund. It's on? OK, thanks. Uh, the, rem I remember uh, Preeta mentioned that, Paul, you may be kind of, the way you spoke, it was more like you were in your previous life, you were born in India. So uh, I think uh, it's true for a lot of people like me. Half of our life was in India, half of our life is US. And I'm looking at it from the perspective that, you know, uh, building the nations was like last century. Uh, what are we doing to build the future global capital? I think that India uniquely has a position to lead the way. Uh, I climbed Kilimanjaro twice. I'm going third time, a Concagua. These are all top mountains. I want to build cities on top of it. That's why I think I'm following Solomon, his smart cities project. So all these new cities, new towns, new states can be built in 21st century, and not just the technology. So how can the global companies lead the way to build this whole new world? Well, I mean, I think that, as I was trying to say, you know, mobile technology was a platform that allowed communications globally and brought it to people who never had the opportunity to, to communicate, to have access to information or education or services or those kinds of things. So I think fundamentally that, that forms a good basis for bringing everybody together into, into the future. And now the question is, what applications can you create on top of that? And how do we make it easy for everybody to join in there? So we've been trying to do things like, you know, which the scaling is difficult, I would say, when you're just trying to create a lab that people can come into and prototype. But if you can create a formula by which labs are created around and people can interact with them and you can get advice and maybe it's you're getting advice remotely you know, I think those kinds of things where, where training will happen and like I said with OneWeb one of the key initiatives there is really to try and get broadband to every school not just the schools that are in the privileged areas but every single school on earth we want to connect because we have a global system. Those satellites rotate around the Earth. There's 700 plus of them, and they're always there. There's always something. So, so I think that you know the education aspect of it is is absolutely critical. And then, then it's this notion of of just enabling the innovators because it's not those ideas. Sure, we'll be up here to enable some of them, but somebody somewhere else that has a different point of view that sees a problem and sees it on the ground level, and they really know what the issue is comes up with a creative solution that we need to be able to give that person or that group of people the capability to actually go global with that or glo go at least regional or you know, expand their influence. So I think these technologies allow us 
to do that. And that's, that is, I think, the future. I, 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 I do believe, I mean, I'm kind of sounding a little bit like the world is flat and it's sort of like everywhere will be a place where stuff happens. I, I don't actually believe that. I think that we will need critical mass in certain places, so cities are important and universities are important and companies are important and places where people gather and you get serendipity because you just ran into somebody that hasn't. So I think that is a key component of it too, making sure that there are places where people can gather and share ideas as well. Some of it virtual, but I think still physical will be important too. Thank you. Last question, Sridham, you want to go? A very quick question, um, and I should, I'm with the press in India. Uh, my question is to Mr. Sikha and Mr. Jacobs. Uh, this relates to the first question about the government, what it can do to uh, make it easier for people operating in India. The State Department, the US State Department said, cast doubts on India's 7.6% growth rate very recently and said it may be overstated. Uh, do you have any comments on that and what can the government do? Uh, some of the problems cited were the legislation on land reform and GST, the taxes. Um, do you have any comments on that as someone who's familiar with India and you as someone who is operating in India? I, I don't have any uh, specific uh, comments on that. I would say that uh, the growth-oriented policy, the innovation-oriented policies are, are extremely welcome. Um, you have seen a lot of work that the government has done in this regard. I, uh, I would love to see even more uh, enabling of business and uh, opening up of barriers and, and so forth. The, uh, some of the things like the, the goods and services tax and uh, enabling of, of innovation, enabling of Make in India and, and programs like this. I think the more of that that we see, I think growth uh, is one of those things that is uh, we often confuse cause and effect. I think it is the growth numbers are a result of the work that we do uh, in a purposeful way. Um, and uh, we tend to think that it is somehow something that we can set as a goal and, and plan for. Thank you so much, uh, Paul and Vishal. We could have had you for another half an hour. I think there's so many questions, but you know the, the show has to go on. Uh, some key messages about uh, democracy, technology, and education. I think uh, that's what you told us, and I, that's probably what the governments need to focus on, is, is the understanding we get. And um, Paul, you know, what can I say? You gave us uh, a future which uh, we're really looking forward to, and I think uh, many of these pieces seem to be you know, on the way to happening. Uh, there was a time when uh, color television was a big deal and when I told my children that they didn't even believe it. Uh, and uh, now you're saying that the grandchildren will see the whole world sitting in your drawing room. So that's probably what the future is going to look like. So I think it's, uh, we're living in exciting times. We have to keep an open mind, uh, understand that innovation is possible for all of us, or at least being open to innovation is... Uh, is definitely something which we cannot live without. And uh, having said that, we look forward to a very exciting future. And with both of you on either side of me, I think the world is going to be a better place to live in. So uh, thank you so much for being part of this. And uh, Aima.